Okay, so I hope everyone is here for the CS161 final reviews. Otherwise, you've been to a wrong place. Um, okay, so the plan today is um, I'm going to go through the materials um, after the after the midterm because this will be the focus of the finals. Um, um, and then I'll take questions and then we'll go through some practice problems. Okay, sure. Um, so uh, here, here I'm. Here are all the materials that you have to care about. Well, you 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 should focus on these materials when studying for the final. So, uh, so after the midterm, we've been we've been talking about graphs, and and so um, we talk about how to traverse the graphs, um, how to find a shortest path on weighted and unweighted graphs, um, how to how to find a minimum spanning tree. Um, we also talk about uh, global mean cut. And Kager's algorithm, or some, or, an, or the cut between some particular pair of vertices ST, and we also talk about max flow. Uh, so those are on the topics about graph. And other, other than graph algorithms, we also talk about dynamic programming. Uh, dynamic programming is essentially a way to, um, you know, to to design algorithm, uh, and it has many uh, applications, of course. But um, yeah, so these are the these. Uh, Oh, we also talk. We we also mention. Uh, we also do some uh, greedy algorithm in the in the class. Um, yeah, this will be the focus of of the finals. So um, I'm just going to go through some uh, very brief details of these algorithms. So um, so the first thing I'm going to talk about here is graph traversal algorithm. So um, there are two ways to traverse the graph. Uh, death first and breath first. So in a um, yes, and so uh, I'm not going to talk about how to do how to do these algorithms un unless anyone asks a question about them. Uh, but basically, with by using the graph very simple graph traversal algorithms, you can do the things like check whether the graph is connected or find on the connected components. You can do the topological sort. Um, uh, and then with that first search, you can you can find the strongly connected components, and with breadth first search, you you can also find the shortest unweighted path. Um, and the runtime of these two algorithms are both m plus n, where m is a number of edges and n is a number of vertices in the graph. Um, um, it's um, it's a little non-trivial to uh, figure out why these algorithms run in o big O of m plus n, but it's um, it's essentially some some a mock ties analysis um, um, that gives you the uh, big O of M plus N runtime. Uh, yes? Could you still find strongly connected components with BFS that just like take longer? Like you could you could you could still like check whether like you could all, all nodes are reachable from all the nodes by just running DFS from every node. Like it would like take longer. Like, I understand that DFS is faster. But um, like couldn't you still find strongly connected components? You would just have to like run DFS from every node. I um, at least I I don't really see how you can find a strongly connected component with BFS. How can you do that? You, you can see if the graph is a strongly connected component itself. But like if the graph is strongly connected, that was one of our homework problems by running BFS twice. Yeah, yeah. So so if if the graph is uh, so if the graph uh, is is a strongly connected component, or in other words, it has only one strongly connected component, then you can run BFS twice to determine whether that is the case. But if it has more than one strongly connected component, then um, then maybe you, you won't be able to find all of them with BFS. Yes? Do you know how to do that then? How to find all the strongly connected components? So there's an algorithm, so there's an algorithm mentioned in the textbook. Uh, if, you, if you are going to use that in an exam, you can just say that, uh, try to find all the strongly connected components with BFS. And for, yeah, um, there are a lot of details uh, on how to do it. It's yeah. in the textbook. It's in the textbook. Okay. Yeah. Okay. CLRS, yeah. Uh, I think there's another question on this side. Yeah. No? no? Sure. Um, yeah. So graph traversal done. Um, next thing we talk about in graph was uh, shortest path, um, and we and we discussed three algorithms to find shortest path here. So Dijkstra and Bellman, Bellman Ford and Floyd Wachong. So um, so. Um, so Dijkstra is a fastest one, but it's also the weakest. Uh, it's also the, the weakest one. Uh, 
um, among these three. So that actually helps you to find the single shortest path only in the, in the graphs where the, uh, the edges cannot have negative weight. Uh, bell manfold does essentially the same thing, but it, it works with graph with uh, negative weight edges, and Floyd was, and Floyd was on do something, it does something stronger, so it finds the shortest path between on, between on pairs of vertices, and, um, and here are the corresponding run times. Um, so, okay, um, so you, 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 uh, you should look at a lecture and the lecture note and, you know, either memorize this thing or write them into the cheat sheet in, in case you have to use. Okay. Um, so dynamic programming, I'm not going to talk much about this because, uh, we'll have, we will have some practice on dynamic programming because, um, well, it's really hard to say anything about dynamic programming because it is, after, it is only a paradigm to solve problems. So when you see a, problems, a problem with a lot of repeat, uh, repeating sub-problems, uh, then it's time to think of dynamic programming. And if you want to design a dynamic programming algorithm, the first thing you have to do is figure out what to compute. Usually you, you can compute a table or uh, uh, maybe a, a 2D or 3D table define, uh, and then define which, um, um, uh, what is meant by each dimension of the table and figure out what is the base case and also the recurrent stuff. So I believe everyone knows how to do this. Uh, we have some practice on this later. Um, Oh, by the way, so dynamic programming is somewhat similar to divide and conquer because for divide, and co so divide and conquer is something we talk about before the midterm. So it's like you want to solve some problem, you break it into some sub problems and then compute the result and then, you know, bring them up together. Uh, so it's very similar to DP if you think about the idea of solving sub problems. Um, okay. Mm, so next thing we we also talk about uh, minimum spanning tree, and there are three algorithms to find the minimum spanning tree. I, I list them up here. So Borufska and Krusko and Prim. Um, so, yeah, I do. Um, you can, so, um, so Borufka and Krusko algorithm are, are very similar in terms of idea because both of them try to keep track of the a set of disjoint trees. And while so Borufka, so for Borufka algorithm, uh, at each run of the algorithm, you pick the for each tree, you pick the smallest edge and then merge the corresponding trees together. For Krusko, um, uh, it's a little different because you go through on the edges and where. In, increasing, in the increasing order of weight, and whenever you see something that are not merged, then you merge those two. Um, so the, um, the runtime of Krusko algorithm is actually very non-trivial to analyze. Uh, so it has a factor, of, it has a thing f to the minus one of n, that is called the inverse Ackermann function. Um, so yeah, I, we don't expect you to know this, um, but, when, but if you have to use Krusko algorithm, in the finals, then this is a runtime, and you can just use, you can just use this result. Um, and prim algorithm is very similar to die extra. The only difference is that for die extra, you keep track of the the weight of uh, you, you keep track of the shock the distance from the from the shock note, shock note to each of the nodes in the graph. Uh, but for prim algorithm, you only keep track of the um, the weight of the note, of the the edge that connects a node to the tree that you have already built. Um, okay, so that's all about spanning tree. Um, then we are, and the next topic was global mean cut and Kaggle's algorithm. So global mean cut is a problem where you are given a graph, unweighted or weighted. Uh, that's uh, both are fine, and you are going, you are to, re and you have to return a way to partition the set of vertices in the graph into two subsets, such that the weight of the edge, the, the sum of the weight of the edges that go between those two subsets is minimized. So, and in case of unweighted graph, you just think of each edge has to get weight one. Uh, yeah. So the algorithm. Uh, so um, so global mean cut is in general is an NP problem. But we discuss an algorithm, um, a randomized algorithm that gives you reasonable performance and sorry, reasonable correctness, and it's quite fast to do. That is called the, that is Kaggle's algorithm. Um, so for Kaggle, Kaggle's algorithm is based on. Um, 
uh, an operation called the edge, edge contraction. So whenever you pick two, so when you can pick an edge in the graph between two nodes, and then you can just merge those two nodes into one node, and then on the on the other edges connecting into those two nodes is now is now pointed into the new the the new node that you produced, and you do, and we do that. Um, so if you have n node, you do that n minus two times, so that you can get down to two nodes, and then the number of edges between those two nodes would be your mean cut. Um, so. To, so the runtime of this is uh, is easy because it's just because of n squared because uh, whenever you try to uh, sorry because contraction takes o n and you do have to do that n minus two times so it's n times n minus two or, or n squared um, the correct the correctness of uh, Kager's algorithm is only given probabilistically so um, if you want to get a correct cut. Each time you pick an edge to contract, you have to pick an appropriate appropriate edge in the sense that that edge won't go into the mean cut because if you you pick something in the mean cut and you contract them, then uh, you get a you will get a wrong cut. And so the the most important result here, I would say, is that if you have an if you have a graph of n vertices, then the probability that you can pick a kick, that you can pick a good edge is always lower bounded by n minus two over n. And just from that, you can um, uh, you, you can repetitively apply this result to say that the probability of correctness of Kager's algorithm is um, uh, is that product there, and which um, reduces into one over n choose two. Um, but in in so in so this is a this is this is quite a small number. So in reality, when people want to apply Kager's algorithm. Um, um, People will try to run it a couple of times and then pick a best result, and, and this is called the Monte Carlo algorithm for for that reason. Okay, any questions so far? Sure. Um, okay, and we also talk about another kind of cut. So for Kager's algorithm, we talk about global mean cut. So you want to find a, just any partition. That minimizes the number, the the cut. Um, um, we the the other kind of cut we talk about was is called the ST cut because um, ST cut is very similar to mean cut to to global mean cut, but it's like you are given a vertex S and another vertex T, and you have to find a way to partition the the set of vertices into two subsets, and S must be in one of the subset, and T has to be in the other subset, and the and then of course you want to minimize the cut, uh, the the cut which is the number of edges run that run between the two subsets that you find, uh, or the sum of their weight in in case of weighted graph, um, and we also we also def, uh, we also de define a, a new concept called the ST flow, so now. So you're given a graph, you're given S and T. Um, a, a flow on the graph is formally, uh, you, formally it means that you are assigning a number to each of the edge in the graph. So if you have an edge UV, then you have to assign a number F of UV. Uh, and, and, uh, and then there are two conditions about F of UV. So first of all, the first condition is F UV has to be non-negative and has to be less than or equal to the weight uh, of, of the edge given in the graph. Um, the second condition is quite more important, that is um, the sum of flow that goes into any node has to be equal to the sum of flows that goes out of the node, and that is just uh, mm, described by this scary summation, but that's what it means. Um, and there's a theorem that uh, you are given a graph, weighted graph, and a node S and a node, and a node T. Then the minimum cut between S T is always equal to the maximum flow from that you can get from S to T. Okay. Uh, now this theorem is very non-trivial to prove. It's in the lecture note. Um, okay. Um, so how to find a, so how to find a max flow? Uh, we discussed for uh, Funcursen algorithm. So. The, so actually, fourth function is not an algorithm; it's just a method. So the idea of fourth function algorithm is um, you is you define a thing called the re residual graph, and then originally your residual your residual graph is just the original graph, and you repeat this process until you cannot do it anymore. So the process is you find a path from S to T. S is your source node; T is the destination node. Um, 
and then and then on the path you find the edge with smallest weight uh, um, yeah and and then and then you and then the idea, the intuition here is that you are, you try to send the flow of size f from uh, of size equal to f which is the smallest the smallest weight in the gra in the edge from s to t uh, and then you update the, and then you update your residual graph um, so um, the, by updating i mean you decrease the you decrease the weight uh, you you decrease the capacity of the edges that you send the waves through. You you send the flow through. Uh, so after you do that for a while, you won't be you won't be able to find any path anymore, and that's when the algorithm ends. So this is this is just a, a sketch of a method. And in order to get the algorithm, you have to specify how do you find the path from S to T. And there are many ways to do that. So we discuss the shortest. Uh, the shortest path and the fattest path. Uh, so, so fat, I mean like thin and fat. Um, so um, and and in order to find those, uh, so if you want to find the fattest path, you can. Uh, that is, uh, you have to find the. Uh, uh, it's called the minimax. This uh, the minimax path from S to T. You can do that with BFS with some trick, and and on the other hand, with shortest path, you just do BFS, uh, and both will lead you. To um, so both of these methods, so DFS and BFS, but we know that they both run in M plus N. Um, so the runtime of any fourth recursion method is just O of M plus N times the number of paths that you have to find and run this algorithm on. Um, yeah, and there's a scary number on how to find the. That there's a scary bound on the number of runs you can find it in a lecture notes. I'm not going to write it here. Um, and sure, so that's on the materials um, after the midterm. So I'm ready to take questions now. Any questions? Yes. So um, regarding like Floyd Fulkerson, I mean Ford Fulkerson, um, when you're um, when you keep like augmenting along those paths, and eventually you do get to like a, res a res residual graph where like the flow from S to T is zero. Um, so how do you like reconstruct with the uh, Max like flow was in like the original graph. Like, oh, uh, so one way, uh, one way, one way to do that is when you run fourth recursion algorithm. Algorithm. Whenever you de whenever you decide to send some flow to through some some path, then you just update. Uh, then you just let's say you have an SUV and you want to send a fl um, um, you send flow F through it. Then you just you know you you just set FUV. Uh, equal to f u v plus f, and then in the and then in your residual graph there will be some negative edges. Uh, sorry, negative flow. So some edge with negative flows. So you ignore them, and then the positive, and then the edges with positive flows are the flows that you actually send through your graph. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yes. Does Edwin's curve um, work for even irrational edge waves? Why? If it does, um, let's see. Does it work for? No, it doesn't. Okay. Are we expected to know how to solve this problem on the on the rational way? No, okay. no. So you only care about the cases where the the flow is an integer. Yeah, and that or rational. Yeah, but 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 if it's rational, then you can you can make them integer by multiplying. Yeah. And there's a theorem that if your flow is an integer, then you can then each of the flow you send through an edge can also be an integer. Yeah. yeah. So you said for the Floyd Roth Warshall that it, it, it had a check mark in the negative cycles. Yeah. Yeah. Um, does that just mean it detects negative cycles? It can detect negative cycles, just That's like the like manifold. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, this might have been covered in lecture, but how do you apply Carter's algorithm to get an ST cut? Is there a modification of Carter's that we have to do to get a mid ST cut? Um, I'm not aware of one. I'm, I'm not aware of any way to use Carter's to do that. Um, maybe one way to do. The, uh, no, I don't know. But yeah. How do you normally compute a mid ST cut? So usually, if you want to compute mean SD cut, you just compute a max flow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Yes. Is there like a nice way, like based on the max flow, to see what that cut is? Yeah, uh, there, there is a way to do that. Uh, and um, so you sh uh, you should look into the lecture note to uh, look at the proof that max flow and min cuts are equal, and then uh, um, there's a way to do it, to to do it there. Yeah. Yes. Um, what we need what we need to know about like Carter Stein for the final. Carter Stein, the one that oh, was like the no, no, no. Oh, no. Yeah, okay. yeah. So the I would say that the 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 most important thing that you should remember about Carter is the probability of picking the correct edge is n minus two over n because there are many things you can do with that probability. Yeah. So the probability of what of picking what uh, of picking the correct the the correct edge to to contract. Is n minus two over n? Yeah. For the first, I mean for the first one, right? For any one. Well, right, but doesn't it become like n minus j change. plus one or, or n minus j minus one over yeah, n? Yeah, yeah, but then the, um, n is the number of vertices in the graph. So after you contract two oh, edges, to some edges, okay. you have fewer vertices. You know, okay. n is the number of vertices. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Other questions? Sure. Uh, yeah, I can take further questions later. Just ask any question whenever you have a question. So, um, so I think because there's no more questions, so let's go to solve some problems. Um, so, I have. Uh, so here I have three problems. So, the f um, sorry. Okay, the first problem is on the is. Um, so for each problem here, I will let you guys think about it, and then we will discuss how to solve it. Uh, I'm also trying to give some hints on the screen here. So, um, so this, pro so the first problem is called the semi-connected graph. Um, so it's very similar to one of the. So, so in one of our homework problems, you are given a, um, you are given a graph, and then you are, and then you ask, you are asked to determine whether from any two nodes in the graph, you can go from u to v and from v to u. But in this problem, it's basically the same thing, but for any two nodes, you, you determine whether you can go from u to v or from v to u. It doesn't need to be both, both way. But it could be both if we can do it. Yeah, if, if it's both, then you can do the previous thing. But, uh, yeah, so, uh, so, yeah, so, so, so that's the problem. So, and, so we should think about it for a few minutes, and then um, just tell me if you have any ideas. So maybe yes. You can do a, a very similar thing to what we did on the homework, where you <coughs> run DFS, see all the nodes that you can reach, sure, and then you reverse all the edges, and then run DFS again, okay, um, and then see all the nodes that you can reach again. And when you run DFS the second time, that's basically what with all the edges reversed, um, you're gonna find all the nodes that can reach that single node. And then you can just say if it's if if you can reach it for the forward way or the backward way, then it's semi-connected. Sure. Uh, so I think that mm. in, in, in the homework we have to say that it was both, but here you can just say if it for every node, if it either reached it on the forward way or the reverse way. Uh, yes. Why don't you say first consider only? Directed acyclic graphs. Do you want to do that? Yeah, because uh, it's a heat. Oh, Topological right. sort, right? And then uh, you can always do it um, unless one of the vertices has degree zero. Sorry. Uh, for a directed acyclic graph. For for this for uh, ac directed acyclic graph, what? Can't can you always get between two vertices unless one of the vertices has degree zero? Um, why is that? Well, if two vertices. Like, if you have two vertices, you have like. Oh, never mind, actually. Yeah. yeah. So, so for your for the algorithm you mentioned, um, 
this. Okay, I don't know if it's correct or not. <laughs> but, uh, yes? So I was saying uh, essentially for like, like, I think what he was saying was like, so we could maybe like have like just add two fields or something. Like, so on the first time we traverse it, we're starting from the source, and we do DFS, then we mark the first field for each vertex, and then we do DFS from the source on using the in edges, and then we mark a second field, and then for each vertex, we just look to see if one of the fields was flagged. Yeah, uh, yeah, so, okay, I, I think I see the problem there. So, if you want to determine whether you can go from any, from any, of, those, uh, any of those two nodes to any two nodes oh, to each other, Yes, then, then, and if both of your DFS is good, then you can say that um, from any U and V, you can reach the source node. But for, it, so this one is only an R, so yes. You can do a topological sort and see if they're like, um, if they're ordered in order to be reached either, like if there are two nodes in the order of U and V, if either there's an edge between like U and V or between V and U, then it's not topological order. So, so, be, so you do a topological result and yeah. and what? Um, and see for like two nodes um, that are like for like if you know you're ordering like V i and V i plus one, so that if there's an edge between V i and V i plus one or V i plus one and V i. Um, um, there wouldn't be an edge between V i plus yeah. one and V i, but right. But um, and if you have like V i and V i plus two. Uh, there doesn't need to be an edge between vi and vi plus two. There could be an edge through vi plus one, then from oh. vi plus one to vi. Yeah. Plus so two. in a topological soft, there there is no need for an edge between vi and vi plus one either. So, um, so let's say if you have the. Sorry. So if you have a graph like this, so then you are so. Oh, okay. Sorry. Can I, can everyone see this? Yeah, so your topological sub would be uh, a, either A, B, C, D, or A, B, uh, sorry, A, C, B, D, yeah. See, and so B and C are two consecutive things in a, in a topological sub, but there's no edge between them. Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 you have, so your algorithm is you topologically sort the graph, and then, and then you go through it and check whether there's always uh, there's an edge connecting the two consecutive nodes. That's what I was thinking. I see why it doesn't work now. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it it is so. Um, yeah, so yeah, sorry, 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 it doesn't really work. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sure. So. Um, any other ideas? So I, I so I would say topological sub is a, uh, is. Um, the first thing that you should do in this problem. We know we're going down the right track, but you want an edge from one node to another node or an edge from the other node to this node. So if you have a topological ordering, that means like A has to have an edge to B and to C and to D. Um, so, say, say, can you say that again? Right. Yeah. Or in a, never mind. It has, the, path it has to have a path. A but, path, not an edge, right? But there okay. can't be an edge from D to A yeah, in this topological order. That's true. So, yeah, that is a very important idea of, um, very important observation. Yeah, so if you have a topological sort, then edges like this are not permitted. So, yes? So, so, 
Um, kind of like that homework problem we had. There's yeah. an edge from A to C, if and only if. There's an edge from like, um, like A to something before C to C, or from something before C to C. Yeah. So like, kind of, kind of like dynamically go through each one. But I can't. Does that make sense? Like that makes sense. Yeah. 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 Okay, so uh, we are closer. So let me let me summarize the ideas that we have got so far. So, uh, so the first hint that I mentioned was to consider a directed as acyclic graph, and in such graph you can do a topological sort. So let's so if you have an order of the vertices in the graph, topological order like this, then edges cannot come from anything that comes after in the list to anything that comes previously in the list. So, um, so if you have a topological sort like like this, it is guaranteed that there's no way you can go from D to C or from D to B or from D to A. And so, and so the problem is asking for any pair of vertices whether you can go from, from U to B or from B to U. So in a topological order, you know that you cannot go backward. So, just need to, so, so now the problem reduces to, you know, given a topological sort, uh, determine whether you can always go forward because that is the only way you can go. Yeah. So, that's, a, that's the ideas we have so far. Uh, it's very, well, very big, sorry. Yes, please. Um, I don't quite understand how much you said before. It sounds like, you, so you say, like, check if there's an edge from A to B, check if there's an edge from B to C, check if there's an edge from C to D. Yeah. Is, isn't that what? That's what you said, right? Uh, Why doesn't that work? So, um, so just in, so, well, okay, let's, Take this graph as an example. There's no edge from B to C, and also no edge from C to B. But you know, from any node, I, so I can go from A to just any node. Uh, right, but it, uh, sorry, maybe I misunderstood the problem. I thought it, it's it's every node has to be like every other node. Is that is that not the problem? The problem is uh, from from so yeah, you to know, so U and V. So you have to be able to know from from U to V or from V to U. Right. Or, yeah. Right, and you can't do that in this graph. Yes, in this case, you can. You cannot do that between B and C. Yeah. Yeah. Would it help to like try to find one node where you couldn't go from like? Like one, like a pair of nodes where you couldn't get from one, like the other, in, in like both directions, by doing like a topological sort on that graph and then the topological sort on like, oh, never mind, actually. Yeah. Um, so the pr so actually the problem asks for a big O of n plus n algorithm. So uh, you can you so you can only do a fixed number of traversals, and yeah, we we did one for a topological sort. What's next? Come on, we're very close. Yeah. Um, yes. I'm still not understanding why the algorithm that they described earlier wouldn't work, where you just check the edges between the top, the like consecutive um, elements of the topological sort. So, like, if it's, I guess, kind of like the homework problem where there's only a single topological sort because it's completely. Uh, I forget what the problem was, but like each one is like a consecutive um, connection. So if you check the topological sort, every consecutive node should be connected to each other. And I guess that follows what we're trying to do. But like, I, yeah. Yeah. Does um, that not work? So, so is that what you mean previously? Checking. Sorry. So, so what you mean was checking there's an edge. From A to B and B to C and C to D. Oh, okay. Sorry, I think I I I think I misunderstood that. So, okay, <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah. So, um, so it works, I think. Okay, but uh, we have to prove that it works. So, okay. So in this case, if there's an, if there is always an edge, like say, like this, then. So uh, then, then the answer, then the answer is yes. You can go from any node to any other. You know, just take a, just take any node and then follow these edges. But how about the re uh, so how about the, mm, the reverse uh, argument? So if you do this check, and then you see that okay, there's an edge. Uh, sorry. Um, 
Well, okay, if you see this, then you can conclude that you can go from any node to any other. Uh, to, to, well, you, you can, if you see this and you can you conclude, you can go. Uh, but um, if, if you have a graph and you, I mean, the re the if there's no edge, then there's no way to get between B and B as well. Yes. That, uh, yeah, just yeah that's true. Yeah. So, so that's that's a that, that is a, the missing part of the, the argument. So, um, yeah. So, we also have to prove that if we have a graph that from any vertices you can go to each other, then then there must be an edge between any two consecutive uh, vertices in a topological order. So, why is that the case? That is the case because um, so. You you can you have a topological order. So just consider any two consecutive nodes. Uh, the, the, so you know that from from the second node you cannot go to. You, there's no way you can go to the first node. And and so if there is not if there is no edge between these two nodes, then there is also no way to go from this node to this node. Because uh, because if the if you can go from this node to this node indirectly, then your edge, the, the edge must go somewhere else and then go back. Something like that doesn't exist in a topological order. Yeah. Okay, so we solve the problem for uh, um, uh, for directed acyclic graph. So how about uh, uh, so how about general graph? Because remember the problem asks for general graph. Yes? So if we had a cycle then like every node in the cycle from each every element in the cycle? Yeah. And if it's not a directed graph then you can go both ways on the edges. Sure. Um, yeah. So if we had a cycle to we could like contract all the edges all the nodes there into like a super node. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, I can do that. Sure. Yeah. Um, but why does it have to why does it have to be cycles? Um, so so you can have some. Um, so what you sorry I uh, what you want is not a cycle but uh, a, um, a subset of vertices where you can go from any vertex to any other vertex. That's not a definition of a cycle, right? So so if you have uh, here's a graph and then. Uh, consider a set of vertices such that and from any though from any two vertices uh, vertices in that subset you can go to each other what is it called strongly yeah strongly oh. connected component so the idea, so so if you have a directed graph you can uh, run DFS to find all the strongly connected components just like I mentioned previously when I talk about DFS and then and then you can and then after that you can think of each uh, uh, connected, uh, strongly connected component as a super node, and then your res and then that will give you a directed acyclic graph, and then you can uh, use the algorithm we discussed previously. Yeah. Um, so can we just say that you can run DFS to, to find, find strongly co uh, connected all components, all yeah. of them, to find all to of find them. all of them. Yes. And O one plus n, we can just oh, say yes. Also, in bigger of n plus n. Yes. Okay. Is it uh, is the problem clear? Can you talk briefly about how you do that? Is, is it just the same thing that we were doing in the homework? Where you what, <coughs> give it a node, you just run it, and then reverse all the edges, and then run it back, and then the strong connected component is everything that it can reach yes. and can reach it? Um, so, um, so I, I would say the idea is very similar to that, uh, but it's not the same. Yeah. Okay. Is, is, the, is the difference meaningful? The difference? What? You said you said it's it's like that it's like that but it's not the same. Is the difference like anything? Else? Oh yeah, because uh, because if you just uh, run two DFS and one sorry you run you run one DFS and then you reverse on the edges and you run the other DFS, then what you ha then just from the home from the homework problem you can determine whether all the nodes are connected. But how can you find all those structures? When you run DFS once and then from all the nodes that it can that it can reach, then run it again and then that would be if if they all come back to that, then that's one strong connected component. And then you just run onto then you just go onto any node that you haven't visited. Well, but it may be the it it may happen that in your first DFS you can reach uh, you can reach some node 
but from that node you cannot reach the your socks node. Right. So so the so, so let's say you run DFS, you start from let's say S, and then after one DFS you can reach let's say U. Uh, but you don't know whether you can reach uh, from you, you can also go to S. So you may become to another strongly connected component. And apparently, so the algorithm in the homework didn't take care of this yet. But you have to do something else. Yeah. So uh, for the record, we didn't cover how to find strongly connected components in linear time. But there's a trivial quadratic time algorithm. You just run DFS from every node. And then you can construct all the strongly connected components in quadratic time that manner. That's all you need to know. You don't have to know how the linear time algorithm works exactly. Okay. Yeah. You're concerned about the fighting thing. Okay. Yes? I still don't understand how running DFS from strongly connected components will let you get rid of the cycle of the graph. Oh, so uh, yes. a, a connected component is a set of vertices where any two can reach each other. So, uh, so. So you find on the strongly connected component. Um, so let's say now you have a uh, component one, and you have a uh, component two, right? So uh, so your new graph is a graph of components. So let's say if there's a cycle in your so um, if there is a cycle in your new graph, so let's say then there must be something like from something from C one to C two, and let's say there's also a way to go back from C2 to C1. Then anything then I will say then I will say anything from C1 can reach anything from C2. Right, following this. And then also anything from C2 can reach anything from C1. And so C1 and C2 will become the same connect, strongly connected component, not distinct components as we found previously. And that's why in in the in the graph of strongly connected components there can be no more cycles. So so you're saying you find all the strongly connected. So you first find all the strongly connected components, and yes. then you run topological order. Yes, on um, on the new graph, made okay. of those components. And those components can't have cycles because then they would. Have been there cannot be any cycles between them, and yeah. that's why there is a topological sort. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. Uh, so Hayden just men just mentioned that they, um, we didn't cover any linear algorithm to do that, but there's one. In it. There there are two algorithms I think in the textbook, right? Textbook, yeah. yeah. And the thing is, if we wanna uh, explain to you how we do that, that's worth half a lecture, so we can't do that <laughs> right now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so okay, one problem. Uh, so let's do. Not a problem. We I think we have enough time for that. So this is a very common problem. Uh, so, um, so, so in the lecture we mentioned how you can find the longest common subsequences um, by dynamic programming, and so this problem is asking for some also also a subsequence. But this time you are given a sequence of numbers and you find the longest. Increasing subsequence. Uh, let's find the length of the longest increasing subsequence in the uh, uh, in the given sequence. So yes. What's the difference between the longest increasing subsequence and the longest subsequence? Okay. Could you explain what longest increasing subsequence means? Okay. Sure. So. Uh, um, so, so the, the text has some explanation on that. So, so let's say you're given a sequence like uh, okay. Uh, so a subsequence is a sequence that you can take uh, that um, that you can get from this sequence by deleting some elements. So let's say so uh, so two one. Uh, three is a subsequence of this one because you can just take two and one and three and then and then remove the, the rest. Uh, two, one, three. This is also a subsequence, but uh, uh, this will not be a subsequence because you can because you switch four and three. There's no way you can get this by deleting something from this. Okay. Is that the same thing as the longest increasing subsequence? So this is a subsequence. Okay. Yeah, and then uh, and then. 
if your subsequence is increasing, so let's say in this case, if you take the sequence of 1, uh, 3, 4, it's increasing. And then, and, and then the problem asks for the, the longest okay. increasing subsequence. Yeah. Yes? So I think it's just, you can solve it dynamically. Okay. So you look at um, the thing in position i, and it's a certain number, and like you go back and check to see like the longest increasing subsequence ending at some fj. That's like the longest out of all of them. Where like where like the j thing in position j is less than the thing in position i, so uh -huh. that you can just tack it on, and then you just you add it's it's plus one to that. Yeah, right? and that's n squared because yeah. you just. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, um, I think that's a, the correct algorithm. So uh, I think I made a mistake here. So it should be a max, not a mean, but. So, so this thing it should be a max, but uh, yeah, but that, that's the correct algorithm. So um, so just to say that again, so the, the the problem can be solved using dynamic programming. So you um, so the thing that you are computing is uh, f i is equal to the length of the longest increasing subsequence ending at position i. So uh, and so now we can. Uh, uh, we can make a recurrence to do that. So uh, for each fi, you look at on the previous positions, j, such that aj is less than ai, and the hope is that you can take an longest increasing subsequence ending at j, and then add the i thing after it. So you take the maximum out of them and uh, add it by 1, which is the current number. Yes? Mean, like if we're labeling the positions zero through n in the original subsequence, or the subsequence, or excuse me, in the original sequence, or in the subsequence we're building. In the original sequence, yeah. Yes. Do we have to take the maximum subsequence that ends in a number that's less than the current number? Yeah, less than the current number. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what's the what is the runtime of that algorithm? And square, yeah, because um, at each position you have to look at on the previous one. So you have like 1 plus 2 plus 3 until n. So it's because of n square. Um, it turns out that you can do this a little better uh, by. Yes? Sort them and then just go linear time. Oh, if you sort them, then uh, if you sort them, then oh, you, can't, so you, 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 you cannot the permute the number. Yeah. So um, the the reason that we yes. Could we maybe like I don't know greedily take like the smallest one out of each step, like so it's, I don't know. I mean, maybe so, not. Okay. That's true. Yeah. Yes. Um, so maybe when you're comparing, when you're looking at like position i, you like go halfway back, and then based on that half, you can decide whether or not to go like in the which of the two subarrays to go to somehow. Do Sorry. You, uh, so, so like, so like instead of going back like one by one, you like go back like half the distance, and based on that computed value, you know whether to recurse on the right subarray or the left subarray. Is that, that's just an idea. Um, no, that, that is not a correct idea. Yeah. Can you sort, so in your stored array of maximum subsequences, can you sort the ones that you already are storing that makes sense? So that when you go back, like you said, you recurse on only half. Uh, but every time, so, but every time you, you, you sort every time. yeah, you, you have to sort every time. So that's n log n. No, so sorting one is n log n. If you sort every single time, it's not n log. It's so, so, yeah. Instead of storing the length of the longest increasing subsequence ending at i, meaning including that element, 
you could store the length of the longest increasing subsequence up to that element, whether it includes it or not. And then you could uh, see if that element is less. Uh, just, look, look, just look at the one behind it and uh, either add one if it's less. But never mind. But like, <laughs> Is sorting on the right track? Yes. Uh, no. Okay. Yeah. Divide it into two halves. Mm -hmm. Divide it into two halves. And? Um, and make her separate. Um, that one and right one to apply the next. Yes, so. I don't know if that, and so I, I don't have any idea of how to do, how to do that. Um, yeah. The left side, and if that ends at an element less than the longest increasing, the smallest element and the longest increasing subsequence of the right side, yeah. you could join them together. Sure, but they can be many of them, right? Yeah, but you could yeah. find the longest one on both sides. Well, the, the thing is, uh, the, the, is you can have something shorter on one side, but n as a smaller element, and then add more things on the other side. Yeah. Just splitting it into halves on the right track. No. Oh. <laughs> okay. There's like binary search on the right track, or is that also not? Binary search is on the right track. Yeah. But well, um, no, it, it, no binary search is. Not on the right track. Yeah. Okay. So uh, well, we're over time. So let me try to give a, a hint on how to do this, and then um, can think about it later. Yeah. Um, so the the idea is when you when so this is the re, the recurrence. Okay, um, so so if you can um, make a data structure uh, where okay, so, so sorry, so so first of all, we because this only happens on the something for so we are only looking at the position j is where j is uh, j is less than i, so uh, essentially j less than i means that it is some f j that you have computed. So, um, so if you uh, can have, can, if you can make a data structure, something like um, sorry, um, sure. So your your data structure will map from from the values. Of so, so each of these is one a is one a j of some a i or something. So, sorry, a j. This is a i or something. Um, but this essential this maps to f j, which is the the element with maximum value. Um, um with a with a maximum value of sorry. Uh, with the value of x you computed so far, and then whenever you have a new value, you can just add that into the queue, uh, into this data structure, and that would work. Yeah. So this is a data structure that sorts as well. There's a they, they, are, they exist that kind of data structure. So, but isn't that log and add time? Yeah. So it's so each time you add something into it or you query something into it, it's log n. It's log n, and you do that n times, so it's n log n in the end. Yeah. Uh, anyway, we're a little out of time here, so um, I'll try to. So I'll include a solution in the slides when I, when I post them on Piazza, um, and yeah, I can take questions after this. Yeah. Sorry. Was there a third question that you had as well for the problem? Did you say there were three questions, or were there only two? There's another. There's oh, another problem. Will it be posted? On Piazza? Yeah, it will. Yeah, so it's I'll put it on Piazza. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Can I ask you a question on yeah, sure.